right, we are Embedded Systems and in particular we're going to go into a little bit of detail on the uh, organization architecture of the Renaissance microcontroller board. Remember this is the board that you will be using for uh, some of the labs in the course, although uh, um, the uh, first two labs in the course are associated with the MSP430. So let's, uh, let's uh, jump in right away. We're going to learn about basic organization of computers. We're going to learn about specifically the architecture of the Renaissance board and general concept of how we're going to store data, data types, operating modes, etc. Uh, one thing that is uh, particularly helpful is I have this which I've handed out for everybody which is the block diagram. The block diagram uh, for this processor shows you the basic components of, of the processor itself, all sorts of peripheral uh, devices inside, how, uh, how different uh, peripheral devices interface with the main processor core. All the processors that you will work with from now and in the future will have something very similar to this. So I guess I should ask, do you know where you could probably find something like this? All right, some manual, right? And in fact, it turns out that this, uh, this is specifically in the hardware manual. And I, I guess one of the, uh, um, one of the good uh, skills to have is how to look up or what to look for in a hardware manual. So uh, for this little bit, what I would like to do is I would like to uh, uh, show you the hardware manual and how you're going to need to look that up or look up information inside of that for uh, use in the future. So in particular, if you go to the class website, in the uh, notes section you will be able to find that. Uh, rather than having to go there myself, uh, I believe I will just go ahead and uh, go to the hardware manual itself because I, I know where I've hidden it. And so the hardware manual itself, this file, uh, which is, uh, has the, uh, the concept of H hardware or user hardware in the name itself. The, uh, the file itself is 17 meg. And the specific information that it says is the RX63N group. In other words, there's a whole bunch of different microprocessor devices which are represented by this user manual. And uh, since I'm sure sitting back there you uh, can't see all of this in great detail, I'll, I think I'll zoom in on this so you can at least have a good flavor of this. Again, this is the, uh, uh, the user manual hardware. And what better way to uh, understand it than to look in the table of contents. Oh, also uh, make sure that you pay attention to the revision. Um, the one I use for this class is 1.6 because that's associated with the chips that we use on the board and also it's associated with uh, uh, the contents of the book. Uh, tells you how to use this manual. It also tells you that there are some other types of uh, devices available. Um, there are the, uh, there's the user's manual software and application notes and technical updates, you go to the Renaissance site and you can look up additional information uh, associated with this particular chip. Uh, all throughout the chip or all throughout the uh, uh, manual, it'll tell you if you're looking at a particular register. For example, what's one of the registers we saw earlier? All right, the out port whatever, output uh, output data register, right? Or Yeah, output data register. And so there, in some of our registers, they may have a distinguishing uh, aspect of maybe of the eight bits there. Bit zero might do something. Bit four might have something in it. Bits five and six may be grouped together and it may do different things. There is all sorts of information associated with each of these. And that will be, uh, uh, we'll look at that in a lot more detail later on. 
the contents are going to talk about uh, specific aspects of the hardware. In other words, we're working with different parts. And in particular, the uh, particular part that we're working with, if you look on your board, is a quad flat pack. And you could, uh, you could look at your chip and see which one it is later. But what I, wanna, uh, what I would like you to uh, take a look at in particular is we're going to be looking at this section here called CPU. Now in the manual, I can either go through uh, uh, specifically one by one, or I could just go directly to the CPU section. And in particular, it will tell us the, uh, the basic features, which I'm going to show in, uh, in uh, transparencies in a few minutes or in PowerPoint slides, as well as a uh, description of registers that will be used and how the different registers um, can, be, uh, uh, can be identified. So let's go back to our, uh, our PowerPoint presentation. So if we look in the general, aspect of this. In computers in general, we have parts of our microcontroller that are worried about data movement and control. And in fact, uh, with the control mechanism, we have to worry about the storage facility as well as the processing facility associated um, with all the data that we work with. Because let's put it this way, what are the whole reason for a, uh, a microcontroller and a microprocessor? It is to work with data whether it be um, simply doing an analog to digital conversion and then taking that data and processing with it, you will need to uh, look at the system from this hierarchical point of view. If we look at a little bit more detail, we're going to have several aspects of our microcontroller system which is associated with the central processing unit, which is that part of the uh, device which will do the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. In other words, typically arithmetic or logical operations on data. You will have the data and program stored in memory, and then especially with embedded systems, you have a lot of input and output. That is all pulled together with a system uh, integration mechanism, which we'll look at in a little bit later. So let's key on the central processing unit. The central processing unit is the most complex and typically takes the most amount of uh, space. Well, I, let's take that back. It takes a, an awful lot of space on the chip. Actually, memory takes uh, quite a bit of space as well. It will control all the operations where data is switched from one point to another. It also has the arithmetic and logic unit, which you should have learned about in your computer organization class earlier. It has registers. Registers are temporary locations for internal storage in the CPU. We will expand that definition. In other words, registers will also be defined as uh, devices to store and read information associated with peripherals. So as we've seen in the past, and I will uh, um, show you an example here, in the past we were associated with an arithmetic logic unit, which I often equate to the upside down pair of pants, and we have a register bank which will actually feed data to our ALU, arithmetic logic unit. And typically you will see the situation where data is transferred from these registers into the arithmetic and logic unit. Now we're going to extend this a little bit further. And this is uh, most notably identified with our computer architecture like this, if you look very carefully, way down in that corner is our CPU. And we will have other types of registers associated with our ports over here. 
We will also have other registers associated with our peripheral devices over here. One peripheral device that we've talked about in quite a bit of detail is this analog to digital converter. Analog to digital converter, as you can imagine, as you're pulling information in and you're converting that data, will store that data somewhere and that will be stored within this A to D converter and then later on this data itself can be brought in from this A to D converter all the way into the microcontroller through some of the buses associated with, uh, um, with this device. And so as I, uh, as I take a look at this, eventually our ALU will be that device which will do the calculations on it. But the information can be gathered from a lot of other different places. Buses out here which will bring information into the registers and this is basically the outside world. Returning back. Let's take a look at our architecture of the Renaissance. It is of course going to have a CPU that can run up to 100 megahertz, 32 bits wide. So it's not as uh, modern as the uh, common high-end Intel processors. But microcontrollers are not intended to be um, extremely high functioning processors. They're expected to be uh, fairly low cost processors that can be put in lots and lots and lots of different devices. For example, that camera right there, which is, uh, which is recording this lecture, has a microcontroller inside, which is most likely a 32-bit. We also have a floating point unit inside, meaning that the, uh, the RX63N can actually do a computation uh, in floating point as opposed to other processors like the MSP430 could not do calculations uh, with a floating point uh, processor. It would have, have to actually uh, replicate a floating point processor using software. It has memory and depending on the type of memory that you need, we have uh, ROM or in this case uh, it's actually uh, flash where you're going to be storing your programs. That could have, in fact you could have zero ROM all the way up to 200 megabytes. Kind of a far cry from all the, the gigabytes that you have inside of your Intel processor. With respect to our RAM, RAM is used almost exclusively for calculations as opposed to a general purpose computer like a PC. RAM does not hold any executable instructions. RAM is used only for data. We also have an E2 data flash. This is a double E prom, meaning that it is non-volatile, meaning that you could store data inside of this data flash and when you turn off the computer, that data will be uh, maintained inside of that data flash and then when you turn the, the device back on, uh, it'll come back. I, I said computer, I meant to say microcontroller. So in the, in the case of, um, let's say that, uh, that camera again, when you are recording, you're going to have all sorts of different configuration settings that you really don't want to go away when you power off the unit or when you take the battery out. And so in this case, the uh, E-squared data flash will hold information like that. The processor itself has a clock generation circuit. It has a general clock oscillator and a subclock oscillator. The system clock is called iClock, operates up to 100 uh, megahertz, and based on the input 
micro uh, or the input uh, um, oscill oscilloscope, not oscilloscope, uh, oscillator or crystal, you can have a peripheral clock and an external bus clock that operate up to 50 megahertz. We're going to actually look at the peripheral clock in a lot more detail later because, for example, the peripheral clock will tell you how frequently you conduct an A to D conversion or uh, how fast you send something on the serial port. We also have reset, voltage detection. There's a point in our microcontroller that if the voltage gets too low, it'll start turning off devices inside so it could try to save what's stored in the RAM for as long as possible. There is an external bus extension and I showed you a picture of that earlier in this architecture. In other words, you are able to go out and to uh, access all sorts of different uh, peripheral devices, 8, 16, or 32-bit devices and bring that data in. Also the D to A or the uh, direct memory access capability will allow you to quickly bring information in from let's say a memory or some other type of device or even transfer data from one place to another. A good example of that, if we looked at our uh, a processor uh, architecture again, there may be a situation where you want to read very, very quickly A to D conversion data, have it go through our direct memory access device and have it go directly into your RAM. And a good example of that was that you may be executing instructions over here in the CPU doing one thing and you might want the A to D converter, for example, you want to uh, record uh, voice types of uh, data, go directly into the RAM where it will be stored for later processing by the, uh, by the microcontroller. We'll actually go in much more detail on the uh, uh, D to A a little bit later. Lots and lots and lots of I.O. ports. As I showed you, or as you could see on this, uh, on this block diagram, we have ports from 0 to J. Uh, not including I. We also have timers. So if I were to have a mobile phone, and this is a good example of, of why we need something called a timer, a mobile phone is not always continuously operating. So if you look at my phone right now, my phone is asleep. The display is not on. But if somebody were to call me, I would get that call, even though the display is off and it looks like I'm powered off. Why is that? Because every 1.024 seconds, the circuitry in the phone, which is associated with the radio, will wake up and it will listen out there for a signal coming from the base station to see if there is a call which is to be directed to my phone. And if there is no call to be directed to my phone, then the phone will go back to the sleep. And so waking up every 1.024 seconds is associated with the timer. So we can set up timers to wake up every so often, whether it be 1.024 seconds or a lot shorter or a lot longer. Perhaps we want it to wake up every uh, one millisecond so we could update the timer tick for a uh, stopwatch, which is a part of your application. There's a rich set of communications functions. There are different types, everything from Ethernet controller to USB to serial communications, something like a, uh, a serial peripheral interface, SPI. There's also I squared C. There's also the CAN bus, which is another type of uh, serial communications. We have a 12-bit, a 10-bit A to D converter. We have a D to A converter, only 10-bit resolution. We also have hardware 
that uh, uh, does a, a cyclical redundancy check calculator. In other words, when we do communications, we can add an error detection uh, set of bytes on the end of that. Low power consumption uh, circuitry that allows us to go to sleep when needed. And we have the capability to interrupt the regular processing depending on some sort of external or internal ev event that might come up. So for example, let's say I want to have the microcontroller operate with A to D data when it comes in. An A to D conversion takes time, which we'll see in a little bit more detail later. And uh, maybe after the A to D conversion is complete, the microcontroller will want to work with that data. And so it could wait for that data to come from the A to D converter. There's also a temperature sensor on board and a way for, uh, to work with data encryption. Uh, these are terms that are frequently used. You can uh, feel, in fact, it's on your, uh, uh, on your sheet here as well. You can uh, keep these handy with you as well. So now let's delve into the CPU. As we've often seen in a CPU, there are uh, events that uh, occur or there are parts that you can uh, uh, use and then some that you cannot depending on how you run. In particular, it is a rich set of or has a rich set of instructions but is not overly bloated like you'll see for an Intel processor. Included in the uh, processor are eight floating point operations and nine digital signal processing instructions. And uh, I actually cover DSP instructions later on in the uh, uh, Advanced Embedded Systems class. It works with a five-stage pipeline. Hopefully you remember what a pipeline is from your computer organization and architecture class, where uh, five things are going on at one time for five different instructions. For example, the one instruction can be uh, fetched, while the previous one is decode, while the previous one to that is executed, while the previous one to that is uh, memory access, and the previous one to that is, is uh, writing back. So there could be uh, five instructions that are operated at any one time. If you remember, when you have branches, sometimes you have to flush out this pipeline to be able to start back again. We have 16 general purpose registers. In addition to that, nine control registers. And the general purpose registers can be used as data or address. Now, in this particular class, we're not going to go into great detail in our registers. That's going to be something that uh, I actually go into in a lot more detail. Because, believe it or not, nowadays, even though it's good to understand assembly language instructions, as I showed you in the first day of class, not too many companies are actually developing code using assembly language. We also have an interrupt table, register, program counter, program processor status word. And so I guess uh, it would be good to note this before I return to the other one. You will have different parts of, of these uh, instructions that are of, of use. So just as a, uh, a recollection, do you remember what would happen uh, for our processor status word? What are the particular bits that we have to worry about typically? So let's write these down. What kind of bits are important or what are, what are things too important to know about a particular calculation that you might have done. All right, I hear one at a time. All right, it could occur an overflow. So if you remember, that happened when you did something like a, a positive number and you added it to a positive number, and the result actually looks to be negative. And that's because the positive number was a very big number, and the positive number was also a very big number, and when you added the two together, they were too big for 
the amount of space that you had available to you. A good example of this, if you're working with twos complements numbers, if you have eight bits and you're working with uh, twos complement, as I said, the range of an eight bit twos complement number is going to be negative 128 to positive 127. So in this case, if you add 100 plus 100, the result, and these are in, uh, uh, these are decimal numbers, right? The result is going to be 200. And the problem is, you've now gone beyond the range of the numbers that are allowed for 8 bits. And so then you would have problems. All right. So what's another bit? Carry. Carry. I think that goes without to say that there may be situations that you add something and you have a carry out. Uh, a good example of this, I believe, is if you have a positive number and you add it to a negative number, will usually result in, oh, and, and the result is a positive number, I believe that will result in a, uh, uh, a positive number with a carry out. Now what you do with that? Maybe something else. What else? All right, there's a zero flag, and typically that's associated with, was your arithmetic operation, did it result in zero? All right, what else? All right, uh, I hear all sorts of different things. I'm going to, I think I heard this. Did your operation result in a negative uh, number being generated? Now, these are especially useful when you are doing something associated with, uh, are you doing a calculation if something is greater than or equal to or less than another, or another number. So you could say uh, if you have A and B as values, is A greater than, equal to, or less than. So. If you did an A minus B and you resulted with a zero flag, it would be equal. If you said A minus B and you resulted in the negative number, that means A is less than B and the operation resulted in negative. If you did A minus B and A is larger than B, you would result in Neither this nor this being set, so that would be A is greater than. And that's the reason why you would use those. Returning back to some of our other settings. Some of the other registers is, well this is really nice. We have a floating point status word. So we have a status word that tells us the operation of our floating point operations. We also have a, a backup status word. We'll uh, discuss that a little bit later. And a backup program counter. And so this uh, describes our register set. Now one register of note is this one right here, R0 is also the stack pointer. So the stack pointer is that register that will allow you to uh, um, call subroutines and return from them. Uh, the stack pointer will point to the stack which has all that good information. In general when we work with our Renaissance microcontroller we're going to be looking at signed bytes, unsigned bytes, signed words, unsigned words, Sign long words and unsigned long words, these are for integers. So, specifically as I uh, talked to earlier, I said if I had an 8-bit signed integer, the range of this was negative 128 to positive 127. You'll never know when somewhere on a quiz, I might ask you for what is the range of a signed long word. 
So remember that. You never know when something like that might show up on a test or a quiz. And when we look at floating point numbers, we're going to be looking at particularly the IEEE 754 standard. And these are used by the, uh, the floating point operations. Add, compare, divide, multiply, subtract. F2I, what do you think that means? Float, yeah, float to integer and then integer to float will give you a, uh, an opportunity to take a floating point number and convert it to a integer. Because the floating point number is is a lot different than an integer with how it's stored. So with a integer, two's complement, you have a range that is, is set by all of the bits. But in this case, there are three different parts to it. There is the sign, which takes up one bit. There is the exponent, which is eight bits. An exponent will be associated with um, being able to uh, identify very, very small numbers or very, very large numbers. I'm actually going to go into more detail in floating point, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in this class later on. And then finally, there's the mantissa, which once you identify if this number is going to be relatively large or small, then you actually have to identify what the magnitude, or I should say, what the value itself of that, uh, of that number is. And then finally, we can do bitwise operations uh, with respect to uh, 8 bits or 32 bits. And you can do different types of operations on that, like a bit clear, a bit not, uh, a bit test. With that, I would like to say uh, that's, that's all for today, and I will continue on Thursday. I will talk today uh, about the, uh, the continuation of our processor, and then I'll also start talking about some concepts associated with uh, software development. So uh, today, we're going to talk about Indianness, and uh, again, this is not Indianness, which I'm sure some of you know about. But NDNS says the arrangement of memory and how the actual value is stored in memory. Because remember this, if we have in our microprocessor, microcontroller, a 32-bit number, and these are, of course, hexadecimal digits, they'll be represented by A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2 inside the register. But when you when you store and move, store and recall move from registers to uh, memory, where it's stored in memory, how it's stored in memory, at what address makes a difference. So in the case of little endian, you store the little end first, hence why it's called little endian, and that way data is moved like this. The little end of the register is moved into the lowest address, as opposed to big endian, where the largest data or the byte is stored in the lowest address. And how this came out is uh, uh, one computer manufacturer did it one way, another one did it another way, they had to keep track. Actually, the Renaissance processor allows you to specify which one you want to use. So historically, I can't remember, you know, IBM did it one way and Digital Equipment Corporation did it the other, other way and now Digital Equipment Corporation doesn't exist anymore and IBM doesn't do computers, they just do, well, they kind of do computers, they do servers and stuff like that. So that's, just remember that there is little endian stored, or little n stored first, and big end stored first, all right? Uh, inside of a register, when you're working with a, uh, a when you're working with 32 bits of data, 
sometimes you only want to work with a single byte and it would be the byte that is at the lowest 8 bits of the entire 32-bit width. So just keep that in mind. Single word or a long word. Long word is the 32 bits. As you can imagine, uh, again, re revisiting little endian and big endian, remember the smallest byte or the uh, byte all the way on the uh, right hand side is stored in the lowest address and the largest byte of the register is stored in the smallest uh, address for Big Endian. Getting back and looking at the RX63N, the, uh, the CPU bus, uh, I showed a picture of that. And if you remember, uh, there was a handout that I had in class. Um, there are all sorts of buses available for the CPU, the memory, the internal main bus, as well as uh, um, additional um, bus specifications here and in the data sheets. I don't think I want to go into this in that much detail. There's also an internal peripheral bus. A lot of this is just for your information because you don't actually specify which buses are used. You're writing software, you're accessing different peripherals, and the computer hardware itself is going to tell you or is going to uh, direct all the data from one uh, peripheral device to another maybe uh, main processor and which buses it needs while it does that. Um, I think I'm going to go beyond this. Pipelining is a uh, general concept of uh, five stage in this case that it takes an instruction and it it does the uh, instruction fetch part of the execution, then the decode, then the execution, then the memory access, then the write back. I don't think I'm going to go into this much detail because uh, you've had this in computer architecture. That this gives an explanation of what it does. Uh, the problem with writing code in a environment like this is that Occasionally you'll have a what we call a hazard. In other words, you'll have a loop, for example. And based on some calculation, the loop may go back to uh, a previous instruction or may jump over uh, based on that selection to somewhere else. And in that case, uh, you have to actually flush the pipe, in other words, the, uh, the instructions that we're about to execute will not really be executed because it's not really the next one to go. You actually, uh, because of the addressing and the uh, specific assembly language instruction, you're executing another instruction later on in the code, perhaps. Um, this gives you an example. I don't think I really want to go into the, all this in that much detail. but. There are several operating modes for our processor and in almost all instances we are going to be using uh, the single chip mode. In other words, the Renesas processor will, uh, will boot up with the code that it has on the chip itself and it will, it will not rely on external memory for the program and it will not rely on external memory for the uh, for the RAM. When you're in uh, uh, single chip mode, it could be extended or just regular single chip. Uh, we are going to be uh, working exclusively with single chip on chip ROM. Extended mode would be um, that you have other memory available to you. There are different types of modes. We're mostly interested in reset and single chip mode. Now, memory addressing. When you have a, and I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail because uh, sometimes I notice that students don't have that much uh, background in this, but in our processor, if we have, for example, a a 32-bit processor, 
that has an address that goes from 0 to whatever the capacity of it is. Let's take a look. If our entire memory map consists of an address that is hex 00000000 to hex F, 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 F. That's the total space that an address could have. And depending on the particular processor you have or anything else, that could be, for example, uh, memory, RAM will be in one area, flash will be in another. Let's take an example. I worked with a processor that had addresses from hex 0000, 000, 000, 000 to hex f, 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 f. And I'll let you figure this out. The amount of RAM space that it had was 640K. So, the question I have for you, if this is identified as RAM, what is the ending address of RAM? So, how would you define that? Do you know or do I need to do this calculation? Who cannot do this calculation? Ooh, a lot of people. All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and, ooh, I didn't bring my mobile phone. So 640K, right? So obviously what we need to do is we need to convert this into a base 10 number into a hexadecimal number. So 640K is going to be, you can do this calculation, 640 times 1024, right? Is going to be equal to what in decimal? Or, uh, uh, yeah, decimal. Say that louder. 655360. All right. So now the question comes down to what is going to be the hexadecimal representation of that? We've done uh, number conversion in this class, right? Long time ago? Do I need to go to my calculator? <laughs> Do I have an answer? Eight zero zero. Oh, A. Zero. Zero, zero, zero? Yeah. All right. So this value in decimal is going to be this hexadecimal number, right? Or roughly hex A zero, 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 correct? But don't forget you start counting at zero, right? So from that respect, The very last address in RAM is going to be hex 9 F, 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 F. And that will be the last address, assuming that this is going to be 8 bits wide. And that's going to be my area that's RAM. 
Now it turned out that there was uh, there was an area here that was allocated for, and I, I'm just going from memory, I may be wrong, um, that was associated with ROM, and this is not even flash, this was historic ROM, that would run whenever you powered up. It might have been at the top, I can't remember which one it was. And I'm talking about the IBM PC. The old IBM PC running with the uh, 8088 processor. Or am I thinking of the IBM PC-80 that had the, uh, uh, the Intel 8286 processor? It might be that one. But nonetheless, also somewhere in this area, it had video memory. So you would actually write to a particular memory address and it was actually a, uh, a hardware card that would display characters on the screen. Very clever. Now there's different ways of doing that, of course. So if I were to say something like, I have a processor uh, that has uh, 16 bits addressing it has uh, 32k flash that starts at address 0000, zero, zero, zero right followed by 16K of uh, RAM, followed by 8K of, uh, um, 8K of what we called peripheral registers. In other words, remember we talked about this, the port was considered a peripheral register. The A to D converter will be considered something like that as well. The question is, what does the memory map look like? So similar to what I showed you here, go ahead and try and solve this problem and show me a chart that looks very similar to this of what is in what location. All right, we'll pause and let you work on that. All right, now we are. So the, uh, the answer of this, do you want to tell me or do you just want me to tell you? I'll just tell you. All right, this is what I think it is. Do you agree? So the entire address space is 2 to the 16th, which is 64K, right? No, let me look at this to make sure I'm not, oh, so that's, so I didn't do my math right, right? Let's see, 8 to 9 to A to B, yeah, that's B. Oh, I hate when that happens. C, D, E. Yeah, that looks kind of more appropriate. Oh, and then it just looks ugly. All right, so. Why is it a zero zero? 
zero zero. The last address. So another example of me getting up too early in the morning. All right, there we go. Not enough caffeine. Uh, so if I were to ask you to draw me a memory map, this is the type of stuff I want to see, both the, uh, the upper and the lower address. And I'll tell you how wide the memories are, right? All right, looks good. Let's go on. Question? Yeah. Nope, 16 bits. Each, uh, each, I mean, it's a location is 16 bits, but um, so the address is going to be 16 bits. I didn't say it was 16. You can only grab 16 bits and put it on the bus. In fact, almost all processors will allow you to put 16 bits or 8 bits on the bus, but they're really picky as to how it comes in. And in fact, that's a computer architecture question. For you, for a programmer, all you have to do is understand that a particular uh, architecture is going to work with this, uh, with this particular microcontroller. All right, good question though. All right, let's go on. Now, when you're talking about I.O. registers, and this is something I re uh, refer to up front, that is the port is considered an input and output register. Port uh, 5, for example, is going to be considered to be 8 bits, right? And then associated with the input data register, there's an output data reg register, there's a direction register, and there are other registers that allow you to set up a uh, pull-up resistor that allows you to, for example, uh, use it as an input and not have to have an external pull-up resistor for it. Um, so we're going to be looking at that in a lot more detail, for example, for the analog, uh, analog inputs and, and such. And with that, we've covered uh, uh, the general architecture of the RX-63N. That should be it for this section.